Okay, good afternoon. Everyone had a good lunch? Feeling sleepy? Day three, day four? My name's Adam Redford. I'm a distinguished systems engineer, and we're going to cover the APKM APIs today. Um, how many people have been to one or more of my sessions earlier in the, the week? Okay. Um, how many people have experience with APKM? You've used it, got it in the lab. Okay. Yep. Uh, how many people have scripting REST API experience? It's okay. If you answered none of those questions, it's fine. So we're going to start off quite gently. We're going to go through an overview of the controller APIs. We're going to drill down. We're going to drill down. And towards the end of the 45 minutes, we'll get to some of the more sophisticated APIs and some of the more sophisticated use cases. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, though, you don't really need to know Python. You don't really need to know anything about REST APIs. We're going to cover that. Um, I'm going to do it uh, slightly differently in that there's probably about 80 PowerPoint slides here. Who likes PowerPoint? No one? OK. Uh, I personally think that um, a five-minute demo is worth about 1,000 PowerPoint slides. So in the next 45 minutes, give or take, you're going to get 40 minutes worth of demo and five minutes worth of PowerPoint. So we're going to cover an awful lot of slides, but I think it's going to be a, a little bit more meaningful because I'm going to give you real examples rather than just in theory. OK. Um, a couple of things uh, just in terms of resources. Uh, everything that you see pretty much here I will have blogged about. So if you do a search for my name and blog, you'll come up with, um, hopefully one of the top hits will be communities.cisco.com. If you just hit that, you'll see that in November I posted a blog index, basically a, a list of all of the blogs that I've posted over the last sort of six to, to 12 months, and I keep updating that. So that index is a place that you can go to to find out information about a lot of the things that we're covering today. It covers um, multiple different ways of using the APIs. It gives you links to the source code so you can download some Python snippets. It covers um, Postman uh, repositories. So everything that you, can, you want to or need is available there. The other link that I would point you to is if you do go to communities.cisco.com, you click on, click on developer and DevNet. and networking and APKEM, there is a community there where you can go to for help and ask questions. So you'll see there's been lots of questions asked. It doesn't necessarily have to be API only. It can be just general questions about the controller. But if you want to uh, ask some questions, that's a good place to go. It's a forum. I spend a lot of time there um, answering questions. OK, let's get into it. I probably don't need to cover this slide, which I'm really happy about. Uh, about two years ago, when we first started talking about APKM, which was our controller for the campus and branch, uh, there was a lot of confusion around ACI, which was what we're doing in the data center, and APKM. So just to, to be clear, everyone is aware that we're talking about APKM, we're talking about wireless, we're talking about routers, we're talking about catalyst switches, and how we can automate those through a controller. The whole point behind this is that we're trying to think about the network as a system. So the controller gives you a single point to interact with devices. You don't have to go to individual devices in isolation and try and do things to them. You can go through the controller, and then the controller will take the appropriate action. Um, APKM is or was quite unique at the time in that when it was put together it, about three or four years ago, it was designed from the ground up to be microservices based. So the controller is not one application. It's 37 microservices. Those microservices communicate via an east-west message bus. And the important thing is that every one of those services exposes a northbound API. And the interesting thing about that is that if you ever see anyone do anything on a, a user interface with the controller, you know that you can do that programmatically through REST APIs. Because all the user interface does is make API calls to the various services. Who's familiar with REST and RESTful APIs? 
Yep, who's not? Yep, do you want me to do a, sorry to bore the people that have heard this before, I do a 60 second overview of a REST API? Yep. Um, can you use a web browser? You can use the REST API. So the analogy I use is if I want to go to www.cisco.com, that is the way that that would uh, appear in a REST API is that you're accessing a location, which is index.html, and you're doing a get. So there are really two concepts. There's a, a, now, a, a resource that you're accessing, which is index.html. There's a verb, which is the action you're performing. In this case, it's a get. And that will give you all of the contents of um, index.html. In a REST uh, API construct, if I wanted to get all of the network devices on the controller, the resource I would access would be slash network dash device. I would do a get, and that would return a list of all of the network devices. If you went to cisco.com and you wanted to create a, an account, um, what would you do? Well, you'd need to supply some information, right? You need to give your, your email address, your password, your, your name. You'd take that up and you would what? Post. So you'd send it off to the server. It would take that information. It would create a resource. It would create an account for you. And then you'd have an account on the server. In a REST API, if you want to create a resource, if you want to add a new re network device, I would take up a bunch of information, post that across. The server would create it and let me know that it had done it. What else would you want to do? Well, you may want to modify your password. That's modifying an existing resource. That's called a put. And you may want to remove your account. That would be a delete. So get, post, put, delete are the four main verbs that you can use. And you apply those to various resources on the controller. Network device is all of the network devices. Host is all of the hosts. Interface is all of the interfaces, etc. Now, there's one other concept that's important. And uh, how many people have had issues with a smartphone where autocorrect has done the wrong thing and you've been embarrassed? Yep. Machines don't necessarily understand what we really mean, right? They don't understand language that well. Now, in order to remove ambiguity, we need to be very clear about how we provide information to the server. So there's a couple of common ways of formatting that information. One of, the, one of those is what's called JavaScript object notation, or JSON. And JSON is the way that the controller um, both accepts information as well as responds. JSON is very simple. It really comes down to one key concept, key, comma, value. In this particular case, policy owner has a value of admin. So Policy owner is the attribute, and the value is admin. Now, obviously, you can get, make that a little bit more sophisticated because you can use curly braces to group things together. You can also use square brackets to denote a list. So if I wanted to have a list of user identifiers, that would be, um, in this case, their IP addresses. It could be anything. But if you have square brackets, essentially what you're doing is you're creating a list. List, structure, key, comma, value. That's all JSON is. And you can see a whole bunch of different permutations there. One of the really nice things about uh, what DevNet has done is they have put up a controller in the cloud that you can access from anywhere, anytime. So if you go to sandboxapic.cisco.com, if you use DevNet user and Cisco123 exclamation, you can access that controller any time of the day. You can access the UI, but more importantly, if you're interested in the APIs, you can access those APIs as well. One of the really cool things about um, being able to access the controller, and is that big enough for the people at the back? Is that, do you want it bigger? It's OK? OK. Um, this is me logging into the controller. Uh, one of the really nice things about the way that the APIs work is if you click on this API button, you'll get a list of all of the APIs. So when the developers are writing their code, there's something called Swagger, which is some annotations they can put beside that API code that will essentially self-document. Now, if I wanted to find out about, um, say, inventory and network devices, 
I could click down into those APIs and I could see the list of APIs. Before I do that, though, if you look on the, the left-hand side, you can see there's a bunch of different um, applications. The controller starts off with network discovery. You can use CDP, uh, port ranges. It uses that to build a, a database of network devices called network device. Um, you've also got access to all of the hosts that are connected to the network that get combined into a topology. And you can do some funky things like doing path traces through the network. So based on that topology, finding out in real time how hosts are communicating. And it even understands things like CapWAP tunnels so you can see how connectivity is occurring between uh, multiple users. So going back to the APIs, um, if I go into inventory, if I click on network device and look at get network device, what's that going to do? It's going to get, so I'm getting all of the network devices. Uh, it shows me how that API works. It shows me the status codes. And if you click on try it out, what happens? Well, it actually runs that API call live on the controller. So one of the reasons I really like Swagger is that if you're learning about APIs, you don't need to have any coding experience. You can just go to that um, Swagger uh, page, and you can see and test out live on the controller how those APIs work. Now, that's the first way of, of experimenting and doing things. Um, there's another way that I think is probably a little bit better that also doesn't require code, uh, and that is um, a tool called Postman. Does anyone use Postman? Yep. Um, so one of my later blog posts, oops. One of my later blog posts down here, I take you through how you can um, import a collection that I have created of API calls for the Sandbox controller. So there are two files that you need to import into Postman. One is a collection of API calls. The other is a list of environment variables that um, has the s controller name, the username, the password, etc., so that you don't have to worry about typing that in. So follow these instructions, and you can get to the point that I'm about to show you now with Postman. So what's the first thing I need to do um, in order to authenticate? Oh, sorry, to, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Why did I not need to authenticate when I used Swagger? I'd already authenticated, right? That was the way that I got into the web page. You didn't see me do it, but the only way I could get into the UI was to provide some authentication details. Now, because the UI just makes um, API calls using credentials, when I use Swagger, it just uses exactly the same credentials to make those API calls and give me the result. However, if I'm making API calls outside of that environment, I obviously need to authenticate. And the way that I do that is I say API slash v1 slash ticket, and I need to provide a username and password. Now, what, what's the username and password? What's curly braces, username, curly braces, password? What does that mean? Well, anything inside curly braces is actually a variable. So rather than having to type in and remember username and password, which gets, I hate typing, there's two things I hate. I hate typing and I hate cutting and pasting in that order. So I always cut and paste apart from type, but I'd rather do neither. So one of the things I've done with this collection is that I've minimized the amount of cutting and pasting and typing that you need to do. Clicking, I'm OK with. Anything else, hard. Now. What happens here is if you go across to the right-hand side, and if I click on this little I button, that will show me the uh, environment. You can see here that there's something called APIC, which is a variable called APIC, which is sandbox, apic.cisco.com. Uh, notice up here the URL I'm calling actually has APIC as a variable, and there's also a port. The reason that I did that is that if you decide you want to use this collection against your own controller, all you need to do is just change that variable to adamiwan.internallab, and you can make exactly the same calls, but you don't have to change anything. Minimal typing, maximal return. What I'm going to do now is if I was to click here on send, the way that this works is pretty simple. You've got a, a list or, or library of 
requests that you can make. You've got um, the verb that you're going to do, so get, put, post, delete. You've got the, the URL that you're going to access, in this case, API v1 slash ticket, and then you just press send. So I press send, I get a response, and that response contains this funky thing called a service ticket. Now that's the token that I need to use to authenticate any of the other API calls. It has a timeout. It actually has two. Uh, anyone know what 21,600 seconds is? Six hours. Yep. So the timeout for the token is six hours. However, the idle timeout is 30 minutes. So unless I use that token again within 30 minute period, it's going to time out. Those things are configurable on the controller, but those are the, the defaults. Now, I told you I hated cutting and pasting, and normally what I would need to do is to get that token, then I'd need to use that token in any other API calls that I made. Now, how many people can remember, I don't know, it's a 20-digit string, I think? It always starts with ST and it always ends in CAS. Anyone remember that? I'll give you a tip. I, I kind of, I just look at the last few characters, right? So F70. Uh, what you'll find is that if I click on this variable, uh, this environment up here, you notice that there's something called token, and F70 is the last three digits. So what it's done is that there's some magic that runs in the background that collects this uh, service ticket out of the response and saves it in a variable called token. Now, in case I'm sure some of you don't believe me, you'll think that I've uh, just hardwired that. If I click Send again, I'm going to get a different token. So this one is 4IV. And if you look up here, you'll see that that's been updated. So cool thing about this is it automatically updates the token. Now, in order to make my first request, um, I go across and click on uh, Network Device, and I'm going to get the first 14. I press Send, and that is actually used that token. So if I click on headers, you'll see there's a header called XAuth token. It's set to the variable curly braces token, and that will use that authentication token to make that call. Now what comes back is essentially all of the information that the controller knows about network devices. I know the family, I know the IP address, I know the version of code, I know the host name. Uh, and there is one really important thing that you need to understand at the bottom, and that is that this device has an ID. It's a 32-character string. It's called a universally unique identifier. Why do we have that? This is a common pattern that you'll see on any resource that's created on the controller. It will have a, an ID associated with it. And the reason for that is that, let's say, let's pretend, that I thought I would identify network devices by their management IP address. So in this case, that is 165.10.1.39. Any problems with that? Yeah, it's changed. What happens if I change the management IP address? What, what do I do? It's the primary key. I can't change it, because if I do, then I lose all the information. And what do I do? How do I manage the old one versus the new one? So because of that, Everything will have a, an identifier that is used as the primary key, which means you can change, in theory, any of these attributes, and it doesn't matter. This is a consistent pattern across anything that happens on the controller. Now, the way that I normally um, remember these things is I normally look at the last uh, four digits or characters, so uh, C9, C7, because I don't know about you, but particularly after lunch, there, I got no chance of remembering that. What was it? C9, C7. I can remember that. Anyone remember the 32-character string? Any photographic memories here? Not after lunch, right? So if you were trying to remember these things or troubleshoot or trace things, just remember the last four characters. That's a good way of, of uh, shortcutting. Um, I have access to the host database as well. If I click on that, you can see that um, I can see there's a couple of hosts. I get the IP and the MAC address. I can tell whether it's wired or wireless. And if you click down here, you can see that the connected network device ID is this 32-character string. Similarly, there's a, an interface ID that is another 32-character um, ID. 
Any ideas what that is? It's kind of given away in the line below it. Essentially what this is is the identifier of the device that that host is attached to. And this is the identifier of the interface on the device that that host is attached to. Now there happens to be a little hint because you've got the, um, the device IP address and you've also got the interface name. But if you wanted to find out, for example, uh, what version of code that switch was running that that user was connected to, you could do that quite easily. What you would do is you'd do a lookup of this 32 character string. And again, I am actually going to cut and paste here because this is ad hoc. I didn't plan this one earlier. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a request that I made before, and I'm going to show you something. So if I just said network device, I would get everything. If I say network device slash 1 slash 14, I'll get the first 14. If I say network device slash 10 slash 20, I'll get from 10 and then the next 20. So I'll get 10 to, to 30. If I say network device slash and I say ID, what do you think I'll get? One. I'll get that particular device and all of the information about that device. So I can see the version of code it's running, I can see the inventory status, I can see the uptime, everything that the controller knows about the device I can get. Similarly for the interface, I would be able to see exactly the same thing. Okay, one, key, one other key concept before we get into some more funky stuff. Um, when I did the post, actually let me do it again. When I did the post, uh, that responded straight away, right? I got a ticket. Now, what happens if I need to send data to the controller? So if you saw what happened when I did that path trace, what, if I need to do a path trace through the network, I need to tell the controller where the source IP, where the destination IP is, and maybe some other things, maybe source and destination port, UDP protocol, a whole range of things that I could tell the controller. The way I do that is it's going to have a body, and that body, at the very minimum, needs to have source IP and destination IP. That's the minimum you need. But I'm doing a post because I'm telling the controller to do the path trace, to create a path trace. What should happen, or what do you expect would happen when I do that post? I get the path trace back? Who thinks I'll get the path trace back? Who's asleep after lunch? <laughs> so you, it's a trick question, obviously, right? That's why I'm asking. Um, normally, you would expect to get the path trace back. What will happen, though, is you'll get something back that's very different. You'll get this thing called a task ID. Why is that? Yep. Yeah, it might take a long time. You don't know how long the path trace is going to take. It might take 10 seconds, it might take 15 seconds. You don't know how long it's going to take. And in a microservices architecture, uh, everything is normally designed to be asynchronous. So you're not blocking. Does everyone understand the difference between synchronous, asynchronous, and blocking? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's what happens to me on a, a Saturday morning when my wife gives me five things to do. I, I'm asynchronous, right? I say, yep, I got that, yep, I got that, yep, I got that, yep, I got that. And then she'll ask me, have I done this, have I done that, have I done this, have I done that? And I'll tell her afterwards. The alternative, though, is not very pretty, right? The alternative is she tells me to mow the lawn, and I don't say anything until I've finished and won't respond until I've finished, which is not a good result. Trust me. Um, I tried explaining that that was a synchronous architecture, and yeah, in a small, non-scalable environment like we're working in, it probably works OK, but it, don't try that at home. Anyway, the point here is that uh, you get this thing called a task ID. That task ID is how you keep track of that request, and what you need to do is to poll that. Now, I hate cutting and pasting, as you know. So again, there's a little bit of magic behind the scenes here that captures that task ID in a variable called task ID, and 96, uh, 96CC, 96CC, you can see they match up. And if you look at the next request in the list, it's to get slash task task ID. So if I press that, I'm going to get the response that comes back. Now, there are three things that are important here. 
the first thing is that there is a, an attribute called end time. If there is no end time, then the task is still running. The next thing that's important is, is error. Is error is false, double negative, but that essentially means that the task has been successful. The third thing that's important is that you want to know what is being created, and it, the progress field will have a 32 character universally unique identifier of the resource that was created. So I need to grab that, which I have done, so 3355. You notice up here that there is a variable called path ID that has been set to 3355, which means that when I press or make the next request, flow analysis slash path ID, I'm going to get back um, the, the results of the path ID. And essentially what this is, is it's the request that I made. It tells me the last update time. And then it gives me a list of network elements and how they're connected together. So you can see the CapWap tunnel. You can see the, um, the routers and switches that um, this path is going through. And if I came across to the controller, you would have seen that in path trace, there will be a new path trace that's been set up that was the one that I actually ran. So you can see here that it was um, 5.17 was the wireless host connecting through this CapWap tunnel, going across the network to this particular location. So the point here is that all of the, the APIs, um, or all of the actions that you can perform in the user interface are available programmatically via these APIs. And as long as you understand those core concepts of the 32 character universally unique identifier, the way that the asynchronous posts put and delete, so anything that modifies something on the controller, post, put, delete will operate in asynchronous mode. Um, and you need to get the task ID, and then that will tell you the answer. As long as you understand those concepts, you, you kind of understand everything in terms of the way the controller APIs work. The next thing I wanted to do was to go a little bit deeper into some Python scripts. Um, there's a bunch of Python scripts that I've put together for you as examples. Uh, and on the blog series, it's called the Top 5 Blogs. There's actually six there, but, um, well, if you count the, um, the Postman one. So this is looking at some simple tools uh, using just these basic APIs that will allow you to, uh, to use some of the capabilities of the controller. Now, this is all just using the, f the foundational ones. There's some really interesting ones that we've got coming up, but I just wanted to show you some of the foundational ones. Um, one of the ones that is interesting is that license info or license information is actually available programmatically via the API. We don't show it in the UI yet, but you can actually get access to all of the license information about all of the devices. So the slash license info, funnily enough, is the way that you do that. Um, one of my favorites is something called find my host. Anyone ever wanted to know where a host is connected on the network? Yep. So this little script will allow you to um, find a host. And just to make it easier, I've given you a bunch of examples here. So if you want to know how to, to run them, here's a, a, a list of examples where you can use the right arguments. So I'm going to try and find the host 10.2.1.22. It shows me the API call that it made, and then it shows me the result. So it's visualized the result. It shows me that 10.2.1.22 uh, has this MAC address, is a wired device, connects to this um, network device on this particular interface on VLAN 200. Um, if you have a wireless device, you can search by MAC or IP. If you have a wireless device, it not only tells you the access point, but also the wireless LAN controller and the version of code that the controller is running on. So just some simple little tools that um, show you how, you how things work. One of my other favorite ones is um, if you look at the interfaces on a device, this will show you uh, for a switch, the status of all the ports, uh, whether they're in use or not, the VLAN that they're operating on, any descriptions. Um, if it's got a host attached to it, it'll tell you the um, IP address and MAC address. And then it gives you a, a simple utilization down the end. So it's counting up all of the ports that are physical. It's looking at the number of ports that are active. And then it gives you a, a very simple um, utilization. 
the next set of um, APIs I wanted to talk about was plug and play. So those are all foundational APIs. There's lots of funky things you can do. Um, but a lot of people have started using the plug and play APIs. Has everyone heard of network plug and play? Yep. Anyone using it? Anyone like to? Yep. Because uh, what a lot of people have is they've got the ability to generate a configuration. The challenge is how do you get that configuration from your laptop onto the network device and make sure that it gets applied in a reliable way. So that's essentially what network plug and play is designed to do. The way that it works um, is there is an agent in iOS. That agent will do a bunch of mechanisms to try and discover a controller. When it discovers the controller, it will contact the controller. If the controller has a rule for that device, which is basically uh, its serial number and device type, that rule can have um, a configuration file and an image file, and that will get downloaded to the device. Um, if you look at the way that this works, you've got an, a library of images. You've got a library of configurations. And then you can pre-provision rules for the device based on a project. Um, And here's an example. So in this particular project, and a project is really just like a folder. It's a way of collecting rules together. It's just a label. Um, I've got this device name. It's got this particular MAC address. It's a 26, uh, 2960C, and it needs to have this configuration file applied to it. Now, everything that you just saw there can be done programmatically via APIs. I can upload images. I can upload configurations. I can create projects. I can create rules programmatically via APIs. So if you can generate configs, then you can generate the projects and the rules to allow PNP to do its thing. Now, PNP will, um, or the PNP agent in iOS, will support DHCP, DNS lookup for understanding the controller. And we're just releasing a cloud version as well. So go to um, devicehelper.cisco.com, and there's some integration into your um, smart accounts so if I go to support .com. or software. If I log in here, you'll see that there is something here called under provisioning something called plug and play redirect service. So this is my real account, right? This is not dummy, this is my real account. And if I was to click on that, what I would be able to do is I would be able to assign a default APKM plug and play server for devices. This is linked into the commerce system so that when I order stuff, it automatically um, creates a record based on the serial number in this um, account to redirect those devices to my particular APKM. You can have multiples. There's a whole lot of stuff behind the scenes that we can do. But I just want to make the point that this is real. This is available to today, and we're about to formally announce it. Now, the point here is that that's all fine. But how do I create these things? How do I, how do I set up these things? Again, I've got a bunch of um, scripts that I've been working on. And there's also a whole heap of blogs about how this works. So if you look at this plug and play series, this goes through a whole range of the different API calls, sample code, lots of different stuff in terms of how plug and play works, how to use it, and how to use the APIs. Um, to show you an example, um, anyone use Ginger 2 templates? Does anyone know what Ginger 2 is? Yep. Uh, so Ginger 2 is a templating language, which I kind of like. It's pretty simple. Um, you'll recognize the, the syntax for variables. It's double curly bracket, double curly bracket host name. What I've said there is um, pipe lower. It just converts that variable into lowercase. So it just means that whatever input anyone has, you know, capital C Cisco, it'll just get turned into lowercase. Um, and my template here just has an IP address, and that's it. So it's a very simple template. You can have as many variables as you want. This is just an example of how templating works. 
The next thing that I do is I need an inventory file. And that's just a CSV file in this case. Um, and all that does is that the names of the variables are at the top. And then I have um, an instance of each of those variables underneath. So host name, serial number, platform ID, site, and IP address are the variables. You saw how uh, host name and IP address were used. They were used in the template. The other ones, um, serial number and platform ID and site, those are used for the plug and play project and the plug and play rules. So given that I have all that, um, what I can do is, actually let me just, uh, Python, I'm just going to get a list of all of the projects first. So you can see here, these are all of the projects that are defined on the controller. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create an upload. What create an upload will do is create an upload will take that template, it will take that inventory, it will create a configuration file for every device. It will take each of those configuration files and will upload those to the controller. It will create a project for each of the sites. And then inside those projects, it will create a series of rules for the three devices. You saw there were three devices, two different sites. That's essentially what's going to happen. So this is, bear in mind, this is an educational script, not a production script. I'm showing you the payload of the, the post request so that you can see what goes on here. Um, in the real world, you wouldn't actually do this. You would hide all of this complexity and make it look pretty. But I wanted to expose the semantics of how it worked so that you could see that it was real and not just some magic going on. Now, you can see here I've got um, a rule ID that's come back. It's successfully created the site rule. You can see it's created the work file. You can see the, um, this is the payload of the, the rule that's being up uploaded because I need the serial number, I need the host name, I need an ID for the configuration file. So although I've uploaded that configuration file, remember we always use those 32 character strings to identify them. So you can see here that I've added that. And if I have a look at the controller now, what you should notice is that there are a bunch of new projects that have been created. And I need to refresh. But you'll notice that there's something called Melbourne 6230 and Sydney 6230. Now, the reason I did that is that project names and file names are global. APIC is, Sandbox APIC is a shared controller. So the other thing that script does is in the background, it dynamically generates a four-digit pin. And it appends that four-digit pin to any resource that is global. Now, if you were to run this script, you'd get a completely different random digit, hopefully. And we could have you know, 10,000 people run this. And hopefully, you know, the probability is, is quite small that they would clash. Now, you w obviously would not do that in your environment unless you're doing educational training. But just to let you know, that's why you see that. Now, you can see what's happened here is that it's created um, the config dynamically. So you can see that switch 02 has been instantiated. 10.10.10.102 is the, the uh, IP address. And if I look at switch 01, you can see that that's switch 01 and 10.10.10.101. So quite a simple way of you know, dynamically generating those rules and uploading them onto the controller. Being a good corporate citizen, I also have something called clean up all. That's going to go and remove all of the projects, remove all the files, remove all the rules. And again, if I come over here and look at the configurations, you'll find that those configurations have gone. If I come back to the projects, you'll see that those projects have gone. So I've cleaned up nicely after myself. So all of those APIs have been documented. Um, so that's plug and play. Lots of people using those, integrating those APIs into their workflows for provisioning uh, devices. Um, one other thing that I wanted to cover was, and unfortunately, 1.4 just came out uh, yesterday. Um, obviously, with Cisco Live being on, 1.4 coming out, we didn't want to upgrade the Sandbox APIC to 1.4 mid-event. That would not be a good thing to do. So I'm going to show you something that's in 1.4 that isn't in the sandbox yet, but will be very soon. 
Uh, and no, you can't have the credentials to this um, controller. So one of the things that we added, one of the many things that we added in 1.4 was something called Command Runner. Uh, if I go to Inventory, and you're in Australia, it's, it's uh, 12.40 a.m., so my controller is a little bit sleepy. It's a long way away. Um, if I was to select a device, there is something called Command Runner. I can actually select multiples, but what this does is it allows me to run any sort of show command on that set of devices. So I could do a show clock. Uh, I can run multiple commands. I could say show ver into include oops, iOS. And I can run those. And essentially what it'll do is it'll go off and run those commands. And then it'll give me the output. So you can see what happened with show clock. Um, Etc. So you've got the ability, I forgot the, to save the other one, that's why it only ran one. But you can see you can do multiple commands and you can apply that to multiple devices. Now, obviously, and I'm sure you're all going to ask this, is that that has an API. Um, whoops, wake up. It does, except my connection has gone to sleep. Live demos, they're good. SSL timeouts, love them. Um, anyway, we can probably just look at this, right? Um, so there's something I'm about to post, some source code I'm about to post that's a little um, utility to exercise those APIs. So what you can do is you can say command runner. Um, you can use the dash tag option because the controller supports tagging. In the inventory, I can tag devices. I just give them a tag. And that's a way of identifying them. So I can get all of the, um, the devices with the tag IWAN. And then I can run this command, um, show NTP status, include sync, and see if those, the NTP status is synchronized. I can run multiple commands um, on multiple devices. And I show you the, the raw payload that comes back. So in this case, you can see that um, show NTP status, include sync, will give me the It'll give me the failure. If, it, if I mistyped the command, it would, it would put those into a separate group, so I'd get a failure message. Um, there are commands that are blacklisted. There's about 20 commands that you can run, but if you try a conf t, et cetera, it won't let you do that. Um, and it'll show me the success. So the success will give me the command and then the output of that command. Um, the other thing that I've done is I've given it a dash human option, because how many people like reading JSON? No. Is this a little bit easier to read? So essentially what you can do is you can get human readable version of this. Um, so that's something that I'm going to be publishing later today. Uh, a lot of people have been interested in running a set of commands on the controller. There's a whole range of different use cases. Um, you know, one of the things that um, you can do is you can actually run test commands as well. So does anyone use t uh, TDR, time domain reflectometer? So programmatically you can run TDR commands now. You can run it on a set of devices. Um, all you need to do is just run the test cable diagnostics TDR whatever interface. And then a few seconds later, run the show cable di diagnostics TDR interface. And you'll be able to get the response or the result of running a, a time domain reflectometer to see the, the quality of the cable, if there are any breaks or shorts in that cable. Um, one of my other, one, other favorites is uh, one of my customers had a PCI requirement around understanding if a port had been administratively, uh, well, not an admin shutdown, was, had not received any, had received no traffic for seven days, and then they wanted to shut it down. So if you do a show int include last in pipe line protocol, you'll get the line protocol, you'll get the last input and output um, counters, or timestamps, I should say. And obviously, depending on the platform that you're running on, one or more of those will be accurate because on, depending whether it's which version of code you're running, some of them will always say never. But if you do the aggregate of those two, you'll be able to tell if there's been no traffic received in the last seven days and then identify that port as being one that is in, uh, out, of, out of policy compliance. 
So I see this as being um, very flexible. There's a whole range of different use cases in terms of how you could use it. Show NTP status is obviously important for something like Intelligent WAN, where we're trying to get synchronization, um, NTP synchronization across the environment, a whole range of things you can do. Speaking of IWAN, um, has how many people have seen the Intelligent WAN application that we have? Yep, so IWAN is an Intelligent WAN application. Um, allows you to deploy uh, VPN technology or DMVPN technology. Allows you to deploy PFR, performance routing. So you can define a policy that says this set of applications should prefer the internet link. This set of applications should prefer the MPLS link. It monitors the performance of those in real time and then dynamically switches the applications around depending on the underlying performance of the link. Um, the nice thing about it is that the full configuration is done via PNP. So you do not have to configure anything on that branch device. Maybe a bootstrap config, depending on how your server provider allows you to connect the, the device to the network. But one of the cool things is that the policy construct, and if you think about what this does, this does DMVPN, it does QoS, it does PFR, so the full config. All of that's taken care of for you. And if you look at what the policy construct is, it's actually very simple. So quality of service now becomes one simple question. Is this application business relevant or not? And that's it. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of the magic of how that happens. That's a longer conversation. Um, and there's been a whole bunch of presentations around how that works. But just take my word for it. The thing that I wanted to talk about here, though, is that this is the way I've defined the policy. So this category of applications called email is business relevant and uses the MPLS link. What happens, who likes email? No one. Should it be business relevant? It's a pain in the neck, right? Now, what I'm going to show you is I will be able to move email from business relevant to business irrelevant just using the API. So I'm just going to switch controllers quickly. I'm going to go across to my IWAN controller. I am going to get a token because the token that I had before is not going to be very much use. I'm going to get the policy for email. So that's just a get. The funky ID that comes after it is just the identifier of the email policy. You can see that it's called email. You can see that the policy construct essentially says that the relevance is business relevant, and the primary path is MPLS, the secondary is internet. Now, if I want to change that, it's going to be a put, right? Because I'm modifying something that already exists. And if I look at what that does, essentially, it takes that policy um, and it sets the property to business irrelevant. Do you reckon it should go over the internet as a primary path? I don't reckon. I reckon it should go, yep. Now, if I press send here, I'm going to get a task. The task ID is um, successful. And what you'll notice here is if I come back and refresh this, that in my lab in Sydney, where it's 12.48 in the morning, my controller is going to slowly respond. And that application will have moved to their business irrelevant class. Now, the point behind that and it will happen. Gee, it's slow. Who's downloading lots of stuff? There you go. So it's moved to the internet. It's um, moved to the business relevant class, all with just a simple API call. Now, the point behind that is that I could define a new application. I could automatically add that to a category. I could automatically apply the policy. I can change the policy programmatically. I can do time of day based policy. All of this is ca possible just using the APIs. Anyway. I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this useful. Lots of information that I've shared with you is available on the blogs, available on various videos. Uh, if you have any questions, go to the forum or just contact me directly. Pretty easy to find me. And uh, enjoy the rest of the event. Thanks very much.